If you love movies, you would for sure heard about Rotten Tomatoes. Today, we are very honored to have Patrick Lee, the co-founder and former CEO of Rotten Tomatoes, and the one who starts six companies in 20 years, to share about how his startup survived during market crash, how to create opportunities in a time of crisis, and get insights into how he sees entrepreneurial ways involving in the future. We are also very excited to have High Star President Blake Dai to be our moderator and open the discussion tonight. Now, let's sit down together. Tonight, we will talk about childhood, crisis, and of course, some tomatoes. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, Fiona. Thanks for having me. Okay, so, um, so Patrick, so first of all, before we start, I want to again congratulate you to have the uh, you assuming that you are still expecting a new addition to the family. Uh, yeah, I just I just had my child. Uh, she's now six weeks old. So uh, all thank right, you. yeah, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, well, this is actually perfect uh, subject for us to start because. Um, before we talk about how you start Rotten Tomatoes, and, and the one question that everyone wants to know is that um, what, what is like growing up to you and how that uh, you know, ex journey or childhood impact what, what you do today? Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll give some super quick background. My, uh, my, my parents were born in uh, Fujian, China. Uh, they went to Taiwan when they were very young because of the war. Grew up there, came to the U.S. for grad school. I was born in L.A., uh, ended up moving to Maryland when I was five, grew up there, uh, and then came out to school uh, back in Northern California at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess uh, for me, the, the best thing was like, I think my parents really gave me like um, a lot of tools so that I had the opportunities to kind of make my own decision as far as Kind of like what I wanted to do, and I decided pretty early on I was interested in entrepreneurship. So I ended up uh, leaving school after two years um, to try and start a company. I convinced like three friends to leave school with me uh, mm -hmm. to do our first company, and then um, I ended up taking another ten years to finish the last two years of school. So uh, I ended up doing twelve years to get my undergrad, and during those ten years, I was doing three different startups, including Rotten Tomatoes, and. I graduated after I eventually uh, sold Rotten Tomatoes. Oh. So how did you start at Rotten Tomato? So what, what was the trigger? Um, you started when you were still in school, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess, because I was in school for such a long time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was actually, it was my second company. We were doing a design firm. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing a lot of web design work for the entertainment industry. Uh -huh. And uh, our creative director, Sen Duong, he came up with the idea for Rotten Tomatoes. And um, he was just a very big movie buff, a uh, huge movie fan. And the idea was basically like, if you opened up a, a newspaper, uh, you would see ads for movies and they would look like a movie poster filled with quotes. And those quotes would always be good, even if the movie was not. So, right? so if the movie was good, the quotes would be from you know, professional film critics. Um, if the movie was bad, they'd still have positive quotes, but they would be from you know, like a radio station DJ or something like that. Mm -hmm. So Sen's idea was basically like, what if I include all quotes um, from professional critics only, good and bad quotes, uh, mm -hmm. and then give a score of the percentage of critics that recommend seeing the movie. So that was kind of the idea behind it. And the inspiration for him was he was a huge Jackie Chan fan. And Jackie Chan had a movie coming out called Rush Hour with Chris yeah. Tucker. And that was Jackie's like first really, really big like Hollywood film. And so Sen wanted to know what, what all the critics were saying about the movie. And so that's what inspired him to go out uh, to create it. And back then, uh, most reviews were not online. So he actually went to the library and, you know, to find the newspapers and magazines to go and grab the quotes, to mm -hmm. write them all down. And then he went home to build the website. And back then he was, he was not a coder. He was our creative designer, uh, director. So he actually built everything in static HTML. We were hosting it for him. And the way we became a company was basically we were hosting it for him for a year. Um, 
we, you know, we could see that it was growing. Um, it was featured on like Netscape and on Yahoo. Uh, Roger Ebert wrote an article. He was a famous film critic. He wrote an article for Yahoo Internet Life magazine. And in that article, he actually picked out his favorite movie websites and Rotten Tomatoes is one of them. And then also when Pixar released A Bug's Life, um, we saw a spike in traffic on the site and it turned out that that traffic was actually coming from Pixar itself. And so all of these things happened within the first year of the site being, being launched. Mm -hmm. And after we saw these things, you know, my co-founder, Steven, he was our CTO at the design firm. Uh, we, were, we were like, you know, maybe we should turn this into a business. So I went to talk to Sen and I said, you know, maybe let's actually work together, make this the business instead. He agreed. And so we actually took our whole team of you know, 25 people, transitioned them over to focus just on Rotten Tomatoes. We gave our design from off to another group to take over. And then uh, I went out and I raised a million in funding, um, primarily from the clients of our design firm um, in order to focus just on Rotten Tomatoes. So that way we had, you know, connections into the movie industry. We were already working with studios for their websites. We had some funding and we brought in a full team. Um, and we did it on a site that at the time had already kind of built a bit of a following. I see. Well, so so what was the, I'm sure there are some unique challenges that you have experienced, um, not only just building a startup in that, in, in, uh, that period of time, but also um, as a Asian American uh, founder, um, do you do you find that there are unique challenges, and how did you overcome it? Um, yeah, with Rotten Tomatoes, I think for us, it, I don't think it was so much a big deal for us being Asian American, at least within tech. Mm. I feel like um, that within tech and, and venture that. Asians, Asian Americans, we kind of punch above our weight. Like we, we do pretty well. I would say almost in tech, we're almost not even considered a minority really. Mm -hmm. um, in, like when I look at tech startups, I think we do quite well, a lot of venture funds. Um, I would say the only weakness maybe we have is in on the corporate side at the executive level. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's not really strong representation of the East Asians. Um, Southeast Asians uh, do quite well. For us, the biggest challenges for Rotten Tomatoes were that we, um, when, when we raised money, it was in January of 2000. And two months later, the internet stock bubble burst. Yeah. And that was really, I would say the biggest challenge for us um, because back then, you know, uh, most websites were reliant on ad revenue to mm -hmm. stay in business. That was pretty much the main the dominant like business model at the time. And most of that ad revenue was actually coming from other websites that were trying to buy traffic, you know, to bring over to their own websites. And so because the market crashed, people weren't able to raise money, um, but also because they weren't able to raise money, they ended up uh, not being able to advertise. And so all, you couldn't raise money and your revenue basically went to almost zero. And so during that time, it's, it felt like, it felt like 95% of all the tech startups went out of business. I mean, it seems like almost everyone went under because of that. Um, and so for us, we had to really hunker down a lot. We had to cut from 25 people down to seven within the course of a year. Two of us went to zero salary. The other five took a 30% pay cut. So even our seven was basically running at like, like half cost. Um, and yeah, I was one of the people that, that went to zero. And for me, in order to be able to go at zero salary at that time, um, I basically just moved out of my apartment and moved into the office and just slept under my desk for like half a year. So you're living in the office. Yeah. But we, I mean, we had a decent office space and we couldn't get out of our lease. So we had space for, you know, 20 some people. Uh, mm -hmm. we only had seven at the time. So we actually had a lot of extra space. I just, I just took three cubes, um, that were all together. It was a cub cubicles and I just put my stuff into the drawers. And when you close all the drawers, you couldn't tell that someone actually lived there. It just looked like a normal office space. Oh yeah. my God. Well, what about a shower and then everything? Uh, luckily our place was, a, it had a gym downstairs. Uh, <laughs> so I could shower there. Yeah. Yeah. So as actually this story sounds so familiar. Um, I actually, this is the second wave financial crisis. And there are some startups that I, um, uh, I used to know that the founder did similar things. So they just live in the office and the shower with the gym. Um, so 
were you when you were in that crisis period um i would say nobody know when it's going to be over right so what what is the what, what what was happening in your in your mind like you know what support you continue to go through that difficult period of time right i think for us i mean we try to do the best thing we could for for the people we had to let go i mean they were almost everyone was friends from berkeley Mm-hmm. And when we knew we had to cut, we basically told a couple of folks, we're like, please, we understand if you have to go, but we really hope that you're able to stay. And then everyone else, we told everyone what was going on. And we asked that they, you know, basically start looking. And we kept them employed until they found something else. And we had such a strong team that people found stuff relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. And we also accelerated, you know, um, vesting for them so that they had uh, equity, even though we had to like let them go because it wasn't really like their fault or anything. Um, I think because everyone was very close and, and that adversity brought us even closer, we really felt a lot like family and that helped. Um, and I would say the biggest thing was also that we could see as we're working on the site, like we were growing in traffic, our brand was getting more and more recognized, our revenue was growing. Um, you know, for us, we knew uh, at the time that we couldn't really grow revenue that quickly because it's very dependent on traffic, but we could cut costs quickly. And so we, we knew we had to, if we didn't do that, we would be dead. Like we wouldn't have um, enough funding to last us even a year, but because we were able to cut so, so quickly and so deeply, we were able to get the break even. And once we were at break even, then, you know, we, we knew we wouldn't die. And because we could see that the, the metrics and everything were improving, um, that kind of kept us going. Did you actually uh, went out and raise more funding or you're just basically based on break even and then generate revenue to support yourself? Right, so uh, during that time, it, it was very hard to raise any kind of money. I mean, eventually near when we sold, and this was like in 2004, um, there were a lot more VCs starting to sniff around and we had considered raising, but then we got some offers and we, we decided to go and take an offer to sell instead. But for a few years, like, I mean, I think almost no one was raising money. It was just a really bad time. Um, and uh, because also, you know, there was a crash in March of 2000, but in September 11th, the, the following year was, you know, 9-11, um, which was yeah. a really horrific uh, terrorist attack. And so it was just a really strange time between the crash, between this terrorist attack. And back then, um, for people who are old enough to remember, all the news, everyone was constantly saying, there's gonna be another crash. There's yeah. going to be another terrorist attack. Everything was like, I think it was like orange level alert um, everywhere you went. So it's just super crazy. And even like the terrorist attack stuff, like that affected advertising. Like for what, a lot of marketing got pulled. Um, I specifically remember we had a campaign that's supposed to run for Spider-Man and it had to be delayed for like a long time because um, they actually had to go in to remove the Twin Towers out of like the movie and the trailer. Yeah. yeah. So it was just a very strange time. And yeah. so I think for us, we were just like, just survive, just survive, like don't crash. And I think now when you look at stuff with like COVID, um, you know, that's, that's worse than the crash plus 9-11 times a thousand, you know, like in terms of just the economic and, and loss or life loss of life. It's just crazy. And especially if you were in, if you're in like retail, hospitality, anything that involves actually people going in person. I mean, it, the hit that you took probably was as bad or worse than what we had to go through by far. Um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting how things kind of go around. Like even crash, there was another crash in 2008. It's like, um, I, I remember we were helping uh, Jet Li um, on his website back when we were doing Rotten Tomatoes in our design firm. And one time I had, I had talked to him and he was asking how things were going and I was telling him, uh, it's not it's not going so well the, you know there was a crash there was a terrorist attack all this stuff and mm-hmm. he's you know buddhist and i remember him specifically saying like yeah everything looks like it goes up and down but actually when you're thinking about it going up and down it's actually a circle so when when it's wow. down it's going to go back up but you also have to remember when it's up it's going to go back down again and you just have to kind of be ready for that and i was like oh that makes a lot of sense and you know i've seen it now many times it goes up it goes down it goes up it goes down that's a very interesting theory that um, basically is like a yin and yang thing, right? So there's always a balance of the world. 
-hmm. But when you were in the moment, though, I think back, you know, 9-11, I think a lot of people saying that, well, US is going to go into war, right? We don't know when it's going to end. Um, so, and same as the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, you just see like large bank like Bear Stone, uh was out of business. And that's something that you couldn't even imagine in the past. So we, we see those challenges and crisis every, almost every 10 years now. 2000, 2009, and you know now, and what kind of advice are we gonna give to particular you know entrepreneurs that going building companies in the cycle, and what kind of advice are you gonna give it to them? Um, I would say one thing based on my own experience is, uh, you know, the one thing you really can't control is your cost. It's hard, especially when things are going really bad, to to suddenly ramp up revenue really quickly, but mm. you can cut really quickly. I usually say when things go go bad, cut deeply and do it very fast. You know, because if you if you cut to uh, half your cost um, right away, you doubled your runway. You have twice as long. But if you wait, like you know, if you had a year runway and you wait ten months and then you cut to half your cost, you only gave yourself two extra months at that point, right? So you have to make those decisions quickly, um, and I think that helps a lot. Um, I say also, just in general, when I'm talking to startups, I always recommend that they raise kind of a lot of them, they'll be like, oh, well, we'll just raise enough to give us 12 months, and then we can raise again. But you never really know. And I, I generally say, especially if you're early stage to try and raise 18 to 24 months worth, you know, if things are going really well, you can you can raise more, you know, six months in 12 months in raise again. But um, if, if things, if something happens, you give yourself a little bit more time. Um, so, and then the other piece of advice I also give again for early stage is generally, I, I kind of use an analogy of, of like poker where you, you wanna be a, what they call tight aggressive. You basically wait until you get the good hand. Mm -hmm. Once you have a good hand, then you play very aggressively, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a bad hand, you gotta keep folding and folding and waiting until you have a good hand. Um, and, and with startups, that's kind of the same thing in your early stage, you, you kind of pivot, you, you stay super lean and pivot quickly and try lots of things until you find the thing that works. When you find something that's really working, you find product market fit, that's when you go aggressive. And I think a lot of times I see startups who go very aggressive before they really found something that works and then they just end up dying quickly. And especially when the market conditions or other things are bad, th those are the first out. Um, and so this is like kind of very general advice, but I think it's, it's especially useful when, it's, uh, when there's like adverse conditions out there. Yeah, so well, uh, I like your your example, and then well, let's say that what what kind of environment we have right now, right? So from one side, you can say it's bad hands because you know pandemic and all the different things. Um, but meantime, you can also say that right now there's so much money in the market. So for the founders, is it good hands or bad? Um, I would say it depends a bit on your business, if you were yeah. in anything like travel, hospitality, F&B, all those kinds of things, it, it was probably bad and it's probably still not great, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but for folks that were doing things more remotely, you know, if you were Zoom, you're, you're probably pretty happy. Um, <laughs> if I would say, um, or for people who are able to make a shift quickly, you know, overall, I would say for the tech industry as a whole, um, especially for new startups, I actually think it's a, been a good thing. Um, there is a lot more money right now. Uh, there's a lot of interest in certain uh, areas like Web3, like a ton. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Metaverse, if anything, COVID and forcing everyone kind of to be remote actually probably sped that all up like 10 years easily. Um, you know, from people being like, I, I was one of them. I'm like, no, I think you should always try and work in person, in the office together. You can communicate faster and more quickly and easily, which I still believe is true. But I was not really open to the idea of, of doing things remotely. I just I thought it was inefficient. But once you get used to it, you're like, oh, well, it's not so bad if, you, if you're good about, you know, communicating and finding the right tools to communicate because you have no commute. You know, you save on office costs, like all that kind of stuff. So it's even easier now to, get, to start up because you don't need an office. You actually probably shouldn't even bother having an office. Um, easier to raise funding. You can talk to uh, VCs now. You used to always have to be in person, but now... A lot of them are totally open to speaking, you know, yeah. remotely. And because they can speak remotely, you can basically talk to anyone in the world at this time. And then 
um, some industries like like Web3, like they're designed to be distributed, decentralized. And I think that also lends itself for a lot more like investment from anywhere in the world. So I think in those cases, I would say it's actually on the whole, if you're new and if you kind of are in certain industries, it, it's actually a really good thing. Yeah. Well, talking about uh, metaverse, um, so right now, uh, so you build Rotten Tomato in Web 1.0 phase, right? So then you went to Web 2.0, now we're on Web 3.0, and you continue to build new companies and continue to invest. So what, um, first of all, like what are your key drives um, to continue to building up companies and investing companies? And the second is that, what do you see in, in each of the waves? Right, so for me, um, my motivation for doing startups was actually uh, just friendship and doing like what interests me. Um, you know, I when I was born, I'm like I said, I moved around a lot. Like I was born in LA, moved to Maryland when I was five, then moved again when I was in third grade to another school or fourth grade. And then I went to like a magnet school, which was a different like intermediate. So I had like three changes all within the first, you know, 12 years of my life or something. And and I was always like the new kid. I was always very shy, all that kind of stuff. And when I got to college and I made a bunch of really good friends, I was like, why does everyone have to go every, you know, because in high school, everyone went everywhere for college. It's mm. like, why do we all have to go everywhere for jobs? Like maybe we can all stay together. So for me, a lot of it was, I'm just going to take some of my best friends, like convince them to go and do startups together and do something that we think is fun. So all six companies I've done, every single one was with friends. Uh, at least one of the founders was a friend from freshman year of college. Um, mm. And every single one was also something I thought was interesting, which is why, you know, four out of the six of them were tied back to entertainment. You know, I did one company in China. I did one company in Hong Kong because I, I want to see what Asia was like. So that was a lot of my motivation. Um, as far as seeing like different waves, you know, in my lifetime, you know, in the 80s, we had desktop uh, PCs. Okay. You know, that was really the big thing. Uh, created companies like Apple and, and Microsoft and, and those and IBM and HP and all that. Then I would say like, mid to late 90s was like internet. And that created a whole new wave of companies like Amazon, things that just couldn't really exist before that Google. Um, and then uh, more recently was uh, mobile. I would say like kind of like mid 2000s um, was when that really became huge. And you had companies like Uber that kind of appeared from there. Um, and then this wave now, uh, it's some combination of like Web3, potentially metaverse, um, AI, machine learning, they mm -hmm. all kind of tie in together. Uh, and, and a separate one that I think is also really interesting is, is genetic engineering. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an offshoot thing, but I think there's also a lot of potential there, um, especially if, you know, hopefully they can get to a point where they're curing cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all those kinds of things. So I think each time there's a new wave, um, if you get in, I mean, a lot of folks get in, uh, there's a lot of noise, um, like uh, internet, especially there was so much noise before in the late nineties that, and when the car crash happened, it knocked a lot of the bad companies out. Um, and then the ones that made it through are, you know, gigantic, some of the biggest companies in existence today. Um, I think you're seeing, yeah. And, and Google and, yeah. and you're seeing, um, that's going to happen again too, with like web three, there's a, a ton of, of crap in there, like, you know, <laughs> lots of scams. Uh, ICOs of like, you know, recently was it that Squid, Squid Game coin and stuff, um, and there's going to be a lot of that. But I think potentially you're going to have some some really interesting things come out of it. Um, one thing I thought was really opened my eyes up to NFTs, for example, uh, was Axie Infinity, which is a mobile game um, or a game based on built on you know Web three. And what's interesting about them is prior to that to them um, coming out, you know, everything was like kind of like the web, the 2.0 version of mobile games. I mean, uh, when you look at mobile gaming, for example, the first sets of mobile games was you just buy the game, like Angry Birds, you pay 99 cents, you buy the game. Mm -hmm. Then the second wave was the free to play where you could pay money to buy items or upgrade your character. And a lot of those, they called it like pay to win. You yeah, can pay money to get stronger, yeah. right? And you would have like a small percentage, like 1% of the players would pay a lot of money and they would be like whales. 
and that would fund everything. But with those, even with those companies making millions or, or hundreds of millions of dollars, even all that money would just go straight to the company. But then you have a game like Axie Infinity, which is kind of like the 3.0 version of it, right? People can play the game, grind on the game um, to get uh, what they call like po love potions or whatever that you can um, upgrade your, your little characters and they can actually sell this to other players. And so they can actually make money. The, the main company will get a percentage of that through transaction fees, right? But most of that money that these uh, whales or players who spend a lot of money, most of that money is actually going to other players. Mm. And they call this um, uh, play to earn. And the thing that's super interesting about that is you actually have folks in the Philippines, folks in Vietnam, in Latin America, who are actually making like multiple times their previous wage um, mm -hmm. by playing this game. And that, that's like crazy to me. Um, and I think you're gonna see a very similar thing happen in many, many industries of like this web 3.0 version where the, uh, the user can actually kind of share in the economics. And I mm -hmm. think that, that part's the thing that really um, is different. It's interesting what you mentioned, um, I think, if I have to use a word to describe it, it's, it's the distributed. It's a distributed, um, you can say resources or revenue or, or um, contributors, right? So if you think about a creator economy, right? That's one that everyone can be a creator, create a content, create a product. Um, Uber, Airbnb is in a way that uh, it's a distributed um, resources as well, right? So you can be a driver, as a as a as a someone that have a different job and then you airbnb you can lend your house and now this this game fi theory is that um that basically you actually can uh can distribute that revenue that are generated by playing the game so do you think that's going to be a long-term trend and then start moving into you know not limited to just you know gaming or or transportation and can even blend into some of the traditional uh, business such as banking. I think so. I mean, I I'm relatively new to this. I I didn't pay that much attention until more recently, um, but now I'm I'm looking at it a lot more. But yeah, I think you know when you look at creator economy, uh, again, I, I'd say there's almost been like three phases, right? The first phase again, where these creators most of their money was made like from ads that the social networks would you know YouTube ads and they would make money from the YouTube ads or they would work directly with brands to do like in video or in content, like sponsored posts, like the brands would pay them to, to pitch some product or to include a, a, a screenshot or something of, the, of their product in, in the video. Um, and then the 2.0 version was the fans would end up paying the creator. So you have companies like Patreon, Twitch, Substack, mm -hmm. um, where, or Cameo, right? Where the fan is actually the one giving the money, they're donating, or they're, they're sending or they're paying to get a video or whatever it is, right? And then I think the potentially the 3.0 version of something like that is the fan could potentially buy a token or an NFT of that creator. You know, by doing that, if they hold the NFT or something, maybe every month uh, there's a new token or new NFT, um, by holding it, they get access to like exclusive content, you know, similar to Patreon. But then at the same time, if, if the token increases, Hello. Patrick. Increases in value, they actually, you know, share. Sorry. Uh, uh, I think you were frozen for about okay. 10 seconds. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I think my internet connection is not stable for some reason. Um, but yeah, I was saying like, basically, they could uh, invest in the creator, essentially, and they can share in the economics of uh, that creator. So if, uh, you know, if, if the token increases in value, then they actually share in it. You know, similarly, you look at things like Uber or Airbnb, potentially if the Uber drivers had some sort of share of economics too, you mm -hmm. know, when Uber goes and becomes super valuable, these drivers and stuff could actually not just get paid, but if they had some almost like equity through tokens or something like that, like that could have been really interesting. And I think potentially there's stuff like that that could happen across every business, this like different waves of, of kind of uh, monetizing. So definitely I see it on the creator side. They, they had the 1.0 of ads. They had the 2.0 of, of getting money directly from the fans. 
but then this 3.0, which I think in that version, it's it's pretty obvious, like it's moving towards some sort of like creator NFTs or tokens or something like that. So interesting. Um, you earlier you also mentioned that you want to do business with your friends, right? Building company with friends. Um, I think in the startup community, uh, there are two different uh, point of views. One is that if you want to do something, you want to do, you know, create a company with your friends because you know each other really well. And the other theory is that please do not do your do business with your friends because they may you have, may have a different opinion on business and then that may uh, you know disrupt your friendship. So what's your point of view? Um, I mean, I'm I'm obviously the one who believes in doing business with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I believe that like college is like the single best place to find a co-founder. And you look at how many great companies have come from friends who are you know high school or college friends, right? Uh, like I think Apple, right? Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were friends growing up, like childhood friends. Uh, Google, Yahoo, uh, Facebook. Uh, I think a, a lot of the early PayPal people, I think early Twitch or Twitch as well, lots yeah. of companies, they were buddies from, from school. And then they, there's this like, because you're kind of similar age, have similar experience for a few years, probably have friend, like friendship, you know, you can trust these people, you know, already kind of, are they smart? Are they someone that you think you can get along with and work with? Um, and plus it's like, if you're, when you're doing a startup, you're gonna be spending more time with these people than your own family your, and friends, right? Yeah. Like a, a startup, the hours are, are usually quite crazy in the beginning. And like, why wouldn't you want to work with someone that you really get along with? Because yeah, it can be hard. It can definitely hurt a relationship if the company doesn't do well. But if it does well, isn't it so much better that you're able to share that experience with like someone you really, really get along with? So yeah. that, that's what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, on the same line, I know you actually uh, have Angel Group right now, PKO. And um, you're friends with a uh, founder of YouTube and Twitch and then a few others, right? So you're putting together this angel group to make an investment in particularly in media tech. Can you talk a little bit about this group? Yeah, sure. So yeah. I, I ran a group or I run a group for like notable tech founders. Uh, I've been doing it for a decade. Um, and so we have folks like, you know, like Max Levchin from PayPal, Steve Chen from YouTube, the founders of Twitch, Kabam, Guitar Hero, uh, Nerd Wallet, Substack, Eventbrite, um, Fitbit, lots of companies. It's about 160 people in there. And uh, it was really just a way for founders to kind of connect and support each other. Because one thing I, I realized when I was doing my company was it, it can be very lonely. Um, it's hard to find other people that can act as a support group. And if you have issues, um, a lot of founders are very busy, so they don't have time to really go out and like network and meet people. And especially if they have achieved a certain level, um, it's, it's even harder to really connect with other folks. So that's why I created it. And then earlier this year, two of the folks from the group um, approached me and they said, hey, maybe we can do syndicates where we can get people in the group to invest into each other's companies. And so I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Let's try it. We did it a few times. It seemed quite popular. And then we said, oh, let's, let's extend it and bring in, you know, friends on the venture side, as well as friends in entertainment, you know, film professionals, music professionals, uh, pro athletes, you know, influencers, creators, streamers. So we started doing that. And we started looking at uh, companies that were referred in by anyone in the group. And then more recently, we decided to focus specifically on the intersection of technology and entertainment, because a lot of us who are kind of working on this uh, syndicate are very strong in that space. So, you know, my background is on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, one of my partners is uh, Holly Liu. She mm -hmm. was the co-founder of Kabam, the mobile gaming startup, which sold to, for like a billion dollars. And she was also a four-time visiting partner at Y Combinator. And then very, I think we're gonna be announcing tonight um, is we also added two more uh, friends as basically as partners, um, they're, they'll be part-time, but they'll help us with like deal flow, with um, reviewing companies and also helping us to get into really, really hot, you know, like deals. Um, yeah. One is Kun Gao. He's the, he was a co-founder and founding CEO of Crunchyroll, the anime streaming site. They sold to, recently resold to Sony for like 1.2 billion. And, and Kevin Lin, he's a co-founder of Twitch. Um, mm -hmm. 
the you know live streaming of of like games yeah and so, very active uh, yeah so yeah. i think with the four of us when you have you know uh, kabam and rotten tomatoes and crunchyroll and twitch like we're very strong i would say within the intersection of tech and entertainment and so that's kind of like what we do when we go and talk to companies in that space we're like we can really add a lot of value we can bring a lot of strategic investors in and and we're trying to do things differently from a normal syndicate which a typical syndicate is everything's well on a cap table the founder doesn't want to deal with the people in that syndicate um, because they're mostly just just small checks and, and kind of random people but in our case like pretty much everyone is someone who's value add in some way um, and we're we're actually going to be cutting the list down and then making people apply to be part of it um, because we want to make sure that every person we bring in can actually really support the founder and we actually try to connect the founder to the investors afterwards so it's it's like a better version of a syndicate. Yeah. Well, in this case, I'm really honored that I've already been part of the syndicate. So appreciate the invitation. Um, so uh, we have a number of questions coming from the chat. Sure. Uh, so I just want to check with Fiona. So do we do you, do you want us to continue the questions before we get to the Q and A, or should we do the Q and A right now? Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, firstly, thanks, Patrick and Lake. It's a very wonderful talk. So um, I think uh, we still have a, a, about 30 minutes so we can directly start the Q&A part. Well, okay. I will read the questions from the Q&A box first. So the, uh, uh, Fiona, give me a, okay. Can I ask one last question? Oh, uh, sure, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So Patrick, uh, the first question I ask you is how childhood impact your journey, right? Mm -hmm. And you had a very quick answer. So I'm gonna go back, back go back to that question again, because um, you, when you describe your journey, I've seen um, a lot of learning, different learnings, right? Rotten tomato, you're known for rotten tomato, but you actually have built, in different, have built different companies. And what you're doing at Invest, or Andrew Investment, again, is that you're meeting all sort of new founders, new different industries, and the learning continues. Do you think? Do you think that uh, the the mentality of jumping into the new waves and is has something to do with your experience in the past? If you were just grew up in the one environment, for example, your daughter right now, right? So in the Bay Area, um, do you think that that kind of stable childhood uh, will create different type of founders? Mm, mm. That, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't considered that before. I would say, um, I think for me, one big thing was, I remember very specifically when I was in high school, I felt like time was moving so quickly um, that life was, you know, very short. I remember I was like, 16 at the time, I'm basically uh, like 3x that now, right? Um, and I, I remember thinking at 16, I was like, I, I wish I could just stop growing up now, like, and just be this age, like, I'm good, I can, I can drive, you know, with my learner's permit or something, and I don't need to be any older, I don't, it's okay if I don't drink and don't vote, right? Um, and I think that was part of it was just the feeling of like seeing, you know, especially at my school, it was very competitive, everyone had their plans on like, study hard, get into a good school, then get a good job, uh, you know, then make money and buy a house and get married, have kids and raise your kids well. And I was like, it feels like there's more to it than just that. And so, you know, that's why I'm like, yeah, I had my first kids just now. I'm, I'm very behind in that way of a lot of friends because I just felt like I wanted to try different things. And that's why I tried living in different countries and doing all these different startups because I, I think the day of uh, the time of just like having one job your whole life um, at the same company, you know, that's something that, like more like our parents would do, but I don't think that's something that we do have to do in our generation. And I, I think my parents did a great job of, again, giving me the tools that I need to then be able to have my own opportunities and, and make my own choices. Mm -hmm. And I honestly can't imagine doing the same thing forever. Uh, I, most of my companies, I'll spend like four or five years, about four years or so per company um, on average. Uh, and then try something new. I mean, I think had I stuck with one longer, that financially probably would have been a much better idea. But I think I just like to try different things. And every time I do a new company, um, especially most of my companies are quite different from each other. 
I was able to learn a lot of new things. And even doing um, what I'm doing now, it's great because I can still work with really good friends. Um, both of them actually also went to Berkeley, although I didn't know them in Berkeley. Um, I am able to learn so much more about the investing side. Um, and I can, I'm seeing startups every single day, like so many, and being able to really see everything that's out there. And that's fun. And I'm still able to work with startups, uh, still able to kind of really give them advice, try to help them along, and it, but also be able to help fund them. So um, I've really enjoyed that. Uh, I, I think it's not necessarily this for everyone to kind of keep switching things up, but I would say for the younger generation, I, I think they do. I mean, maybe not do their own startup, but I think they do jump around in jobs and, and try different things out much more than in the generation above us. So if there is a, this is the last question. So if you can time travel back to when you were 16 and you have, let's say 30 seconds to give yourself an advice, what kind of advice are you gonna to give to the 16 year old Patrick? Mm. Oh, well, um, I think that everything will be fine and not to like get too stressed about the ups and downs so much. Um, you know, as long as you have your health and your friends and your family and your reputation, I think everything else, nothing else is that important, you know? Um, and I would say, you know, again, I have a lot of friends who are extremely successful, but um, when you see them, like when you, they've achieved that level of success in their career, what else is necessary? Usually they end up just focusing on family and health and friends and all that kind of stuff. And, and you see a lot of folks who have been very successful that actually still have issues, marital issues. You look at like Bill and Linda Gates or, or Bezos or, or depression and anxiety. You look at like rest in peace, like, like Tony from Zappos and stuff like it's still, they've achieved one thing at a super high level, but they still have potentially have other issues. I think Elon Musk is divorced or multi, maybe yeah. multiple times. Yeah, I mean, so it doesn't always give you all the happiness you think. So you have to just balance all of those things. Um, I would say health, friends and family are super important. Uh, reputation is really important. And then I would say like career and, and um, economic success, I would say is third after, or fourth after all those things. The career is actually related to reputation as well, right? So yeah, yeah, it is. But uh, but at the same time, like um, how you treat other people and work with other people, um, sometimes may fight versus uh, how you achieve in your career. So what's your reputation? I think I I want to say I think it's pretty good. I've I've always tried to be really helpful. As, yeah. as what was what's your all your friends if they putting the words to describe you as your reputation? What would they say? Um, I believe they would say nice and very helpful. Like, I think I always just try to help everyone. Yeah. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah. Thanks for so, having me. Taking, taking away is that health, family and friends and reputation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. With that, and I want to thank you first for spending time with us. And then I will hand it over to Fiona for the questions from the audience. Thanks, Lake. Thank you. Thank you, Lake, and thank you, Patrick, for the uh, great sharing. Uh, so, um, okay, I got a, a lot, a lot of questions here. So, the first question from the audience we have is, what excites you about the future of entertainment technology? Do you think the next hot field would be metaverse? Yeah, I mean that. That's probably one of the top things that I'm excited about. Um, you know, I've read, I've read like the Ready Player One, saw the book, I read Snow Crash, all those <laughs> mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, um, and it's something, you know, VR, AR, I've, I've always thought was quite cool. I think it's starting to be at the point where it actually really, you know, is something that can be used by everyone. Uh, Pokemon Go, you know, on the AR side, um, the Oculus Quest 2 with the, on the VR side, um, I bought it. I think it's, it's super interesting. And you're looking at all these companies like Facebook made a huge push into the metaverse um, just last week. And, you know, Apple is releasing AR glasses, uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon are all looking at heavily at the space as well. Um, I think the ability for us to be in a potentially virtual world 
to be connected to everyone even more so than we are now through like instant messaging and social media um, for the digital version of ourselves to be um, almost like more important than our physical versions of ourselves. Uh, I think that stuff is, it, it's super interesting. Um, and I, I definitely think we're moving there. It's still a long ways, you know, I would say probably 10, 20 years before we get something that kind of more resembles Ready Player One. But I think um, moving that direction is super interesting. And, and for me also, one thing that I think, I hope will happen is we can come up with a new way of handling education. Um, I believe that education is super, super important and basically can solve every problem we have on the planet um, through education, through you know, helping with population, through helping with uh, communication, through earning potential. And I think the, the days of in-person, one teacher to 30 students or 20, 30 students, I don't think that really scales well. And I hope stuff like Metaverse with an AI and all these things can, can potentially help scale it to the point where um, ideally everyone in the world has like a high quality college level education, in, you know, including in Africa, mm -hmm. in, in the Midwest, in uh, India uh, and elsewhere. Very interesting. And that's really great information. All right. So uh, the next, next question we have is, um, okay, this one is also very interesting. So what unique, unique challenges you, have you experienced as an Asian American in business? So have you experienced a, a noticeable difference in discrimination since the COVID-19 pandem pandemic? Or, and how do you cope with uh, discrimination and what might you suggest to other Asian American professionals who might be facing the same, same issue? Right, okay. Um, I would say uh, in terms of discrimination, all those things, I didn't feel it so much from the tech venture side, from the uh, career wise, I mean, I would say definitely, you know, if you were like a, a white male, it, you would still have an edge over any other, you know, group. Um, but it wasn't so bad that it was like really noticeable. Um, I think we did find, you know, again, coming out of Berkeley, Berkeley has a very large uh, yeah. Asian uh, student population. And that was one of the main reasons why I chose it. Being in you know San Francisco in the Bay Area, there's you know I almost wouldn't say that I don't feel like a minority so much here. Um, if anything, I always felt it much more on the outside of of um, uh, career wise. I felt more um, like discrimination and, and things like that uh, more just personally. Um, you know, I remember when I was growing up, I, I was quite shy from moving around so much, but um, in my elementary school, there were not many Asians. And I would say I, I felt kind of invisible um, a lot of times. Um, just, you know, you would never, you're never cool. You, most people just didn't even know that you were around. Um, and, and I definitely felt that much more. And I would say that those kinds of things, um, I felt much more like in media. And, you know, especially when I traveled to Asia and lived in Asia for three years in China, six years in Hong Kong, half a year in Taiwan, um, I realized that like how we, how others view us and how we view ourselves is based on our representations in media. And growing up here in the US, um, you know, they haven't done a great job. I would say the last few years, like post crazy Rich Asians, it's, it's a lot better, but prior to that, you know, we were always just the Kung Fu guys or the computer programmer guys or the dragon ladies or the d Chinese food delivery man person, right? And so many, so many times we're background person, right? You, you have like a CSI and, and you know, Archie is, is the guy who's just the computer programmer guy who's, who helps the, helps the heroes, you know, uh, they're tracking on the computer and helps the heroes find the villain or whatever. Um, and there's, there's always been so much of that and, uh, and I think that really affects all how we all grew up and how we think of each other ourselves. And I would honestly challenge anyone here who's, who's spent a lot of time growing up here um, as, as far as the way you think, like, honestly, you know, name, name like an Asian male that you think is as good looking as like Captain America or Thor, 
in the movies. And all, I think most people who grew up here wouldn't be able to do it. But you go to Asia, you go to Japan, you go to Korea, you go to whatever, uh, ask them, they'll be able to name some people. But, but we can't because we just, we don't see it. Like we don't believe it. And so I think I've always felt much more on that side. And I feel like it's, it's been a lot better now with you know, Crazy Rich Asians and with stuff like Shang-Chi and um, Parasite. Mulan. And, Mulan. Yeah, Mulan, um, uh, Minari. Like it's, it's a lot better. I really hope it sticks because I think that more than anything else is what will help uh, Asians in the US. That's true. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, let's move to the next question. Uh, it's in the, our Q&A box. So who are the early employees in your startup? How did you hire them? Um, yeah, so like at Rotten Tomatoes, a lot of them, like I said, a couple were friends that I just knew in college and convinced them to join me. Um, for Rotten Tomatoes, you know, like Sen, who was the creator, he was just down the hall from me, freshman year of college. Um, and uh, from there, there was some friends of friends. Uh, I also remember our design firm, we, when we were looking for more people, we actually just posted on at Berkeley for a summer internship. I remember we had 100 applicants. We interviewed 30. We brought in 12 for the internship, ended up even hiring seven into our design firm. So that was, you know, we were, we were very lucky because we were, at the time we were based in Berkeley. So we were just able to kind of pull from Berkeley. And I think that's one big advantage for startups in the Bay Area is, you know, you potentially can pull from, from Berkeley and Stanford. Um, in addition to like so many people, uh, well, in the past, moving to the Bay Area to, to find work in tech. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we, we were able to find all our early folks. And the thing that's really cool also with Rotten Tomatoes was I mentioned that we were like a family. Well, our, uh, one of our editors ended up marrying my younger brother. So she's now like my sister-in-law. And then actually like the other editor, his cousin ended up marrying um, my co-founder. So they're like cousin-in-law. So we actually became a, a real family. Um, and then even my two co-founders, Sen and Steven from Rotten Tomatoes, we do a monthly call. Like every month we go and do a call for an hour just to kind of catch up. One, one's in Sacramento and, and uh, Sen is in Sacramento and Steven's in Singapore right now working for WeChat. But yeah, we, keep, we always just kind of still in touch. And this is, you know, the site started in 98. So that it's, it's a pretty old site and we've been friends ever since. Wow, very interesting story. Okay, uh, well, so the next question we have for you is, what are your views on customer experience? Um, I mean, I think it's super important. I think with anything you do, um, basically, like, are you giving value to the user, um, the customer? And if you're not, then they can always move somewhere else very quickly, very easily. Uh, so anything you do, I think it has to start from there. I mean, it could be specifically like the way you think of customer experience, you know, like, oh, I had a problem and they fixed it very quickly. Like, you know, Amazon did a great job where it's really easy to, to return things, you know, or even just shipping to your house um, was a huge improvement over before when you had to actually, you know, go out and, and buy it in person. But then when there's a problem and you need to exchange it, like Amazon makes it really easy. Uh, you know, Zappos obviously did a great job with customer experience. But I think a lot of it is, are you solving a really important problem for someone? You know, you look at things like Uber, um, compared to taxis, like uh, I'm sure a lot of you in the past have taken taxis, but it's like, they didn't have uh, change. You know, you couldn't play with your credit card. You had to pay with change, uh, with cash. They almost always didn't have change or pretended they didn't have change. Generally, the, the cab drivers were usually pretty angry and drove really aggressively, you know, um, and a lot of things were just not good experience. It was quite expensive most of the time. And then to the point of Uber, you just press a button, it comes up to you, it picks up. Generally, the cars were like cleaner. The people were generally a lot nicer. You get, you get to where you need to go. Most of the time, it's, it's a lot cheaper if it's not surging. Like everything about it, you don't have to pay in person. Like they, this is the kind of stuff that like leads to customer experience. This is the kind of stuff that, is, that changes everything. And I think if you're gonna do a startup, you really have to solve that customer problem so much better that they would give up whatever they were doing before to switch to doing it through you, um, to pay you, to use you. Uh, and that all kind of starts through um, customer 
experience in solving the problem for them. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, some of our audience would like to know uh, how. Uh, what do you think is the best way to find a technical partners? If uh, if I can find, I can't find uh, one among my own friends. Can you give him some suggestions? Yeah. Um, there's like a group called uh, On Deck in the Bay Area. They were doing like um, folks who are interested in uh, founding a company. And they were almost, it was almost like founder dating. They would, uh, I think, meet up for people to meet each other, potentially find new founders to kind of start something. You know, conferences and, and mixers are another way, potentially organizations like Heista, where you could potentially meet other people um, to, to get to know them, to maybe work together. I think that's not necessarily super easy compared to like knowing someone from your work or knowing someone from uh, college. Uh, because you would know them better. Um, but I would say it's possible if you are able to then, kind of like if you think about it as like dating, that you meet someone, you think they're interesting, you you meet up a couple of times, you try doing a, a smaller project or see if you can really get along with them. Um, just like you wouldn't go to a bar uh, and just get married on the on the on one date, you know, um, unless you're in Vegas or something. But like same thing, if you meet someone through an organization, through a conference, whatever, uh, you still want to try to um, kind of date and see if it if you can actually work together because like I said when you're actually founding a company together you're going to spend more time with this person than your your friends or family by probably by a lot um, so you can't just go into it uh, without enough like uh, vetting um, the other thing I would say from a networking perspective is if you really want to meet some folks within a certain industry or within a certain skill set um, is to get involved with existing organizations and events or start your own. Because if you start one, I'm just like I started my own tech group um, and then I was able to meet like amazing tech founders that way. You organize something, invite a speaker, you only need to get like, you know, 20 some people to show up and you could probably get a pretty good speaker to show up, to come and speak. Uh, then if you're the organizer, you're gonna know them. Uh, do this, you know, once a month for a year, you already know 12 people and everyone who's attended, you probably have like 100, 200 people at least between those 12 events you're going to know all those people as well. Um, so that's like a super good way to kind of um, meet new people and especially within, and you can literally do that for any industry you're interested in. You're like, hey, I like uh, AI. You can just organize your own AI events and get an AI speaker. I, I don't think it's that hard. You just need to be organized and, and put the work in. Wow, that's a really helpful suggestion. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, uh, okay, another question I have is, uh, at the moment, how do you measure success? And what are your metrics? Metrics, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, I, I it's interesting because around all my tech founders, you know, we didn't we didn't sell Rotten Tomatoes for very much. Like we sold it for ten million. Uh, most companies these days raise more than that, in multiple times more than that. I mean, it's crazy. We sold in two thousand four. This is before Google went public, so it's like a really weird time. Um, uh, we almost sold it the worst possible time you can. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Rotten Tomatoes is, I, I would say, pretty well known. Like a lot of people recognize the name more so than, I, you know, 90, some 99% of companies out there that are far more valuable. Um, and, you know, I thought about these, this, this stuff a lot. And I'm just happy that we made something that actually positively affects people's lives. Um, the amount of time and money we save someone from not seeing a bad movie is, is small, but if you take it across how many people we've saved time and money from, it's probably a huge, huge number. Um, and so I think that uh, is really important. Being able to make a positive difference, like having impact. As I've gotten older, I realized that is more and more important. Um, so I've always liked advising and, and you know speaking, if I can be helpful to people, mentoring. Now I'm really happy that I can also help fund companies and, and support them in that way as well. Um, so for me, uh, like I said, you know, the things about around reputation, around impact, I think are really huge. And I would say for, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now with like the syndicate and stuff, most likely I would either do something around education or, or metaverse or something that's some kind of combination of the two. Um, just because I think it's, um, you know, especially when you have kids and everything you think about the future, like, uh, some of the ways the world is going with COVID and with 
um, the politics globally and everything, it, it, it's a little bit scary sometimes, you know, when you think about it. Okay, uh, really awesome. And uh, the next question is, how to be more entrepreneurial and prepare for a career as an entrepreneur while still in school? Right, so I would say, uh, Two big pieces of advice I would give, especially if you're still in school. Um, one is how conservative are you? How able to handle risk are you? Um, one thing I see that kind of will set students one way or the other when they, a lot of times when they talk to me and they're in school or recently out of school and they're thinking about doing a startup, sometimes they'll come up to me and they're saying like, hey, I'm thinking about joining or doing a startup, but I was thinking about going to work first get a few years of experience, then leave to do a startup. But generally, I mean, those people, I would say like 99.9% .9 of them will never ever leave. Um, they're basically already saying, I'm too conservative uh, and too risk averse to ever do a startup. Um, the, the number one thing I think you need to be able to do a startup is irrational confidence. Uh, I had so much of that when I was younger, but much less so now as I get older, I actually get more conservative as I get older, but uh, irrational confidence because everyone around you is gonna say no. You're gonna have your friends, your family. They're gonna be like, "What are you doing? Why are you? Why are you leaving school? Why are you? Why did you quit that job? Or why did you not take that job?" Um, when you try and raise money, uh, when you're trying to get customers or people to pay you, um, to try and get employees or people, friends to quit school or quit their job to come work for you, like you're gonna get so many no's. And if you don't have that kind of confidence in yourself, um, then uh, you're gonna like listen to them, their no's, and you're gonna give up. So I think like a almost like a bad entrepreneur, someone who's not really meant to be an entrepreneur, they're gonna give up when they hear the no's. A good one is gonna hear the no's keep going. A great one is gonna be able to convince some of those no's and turn them into yeses. So um, I think that's number one. Number two is you need to be focused. Uh, an entrepreneur, because they have this irrational confidence, they believe in themselves, they believe they can do anything. And so they want to do everything. Doing everything is death. You can't go out and do all the features for all the categories for all the markets on day one. Like you're gonna spread yourself too thin. You can't you know, boil the ocean. Look at all the best companies. Facebook only was in Harvard. Um, Google was only doing search. Amazon was only doing books in the beginning. It's because they are super focused, they are successful. Think about every single company you can think of in the beginning. They basically did like one thing for one small category for one small market in the beginning. And even now every fast food chain pretty much that you can think of does one thing like hamburgers or pizza or donuts or Chinese food. And you can think of the companies just when I say that, which ones I'm talking about, right? Like that's how um, focused you need to be. And if you're focused, you have a chance. If you're unfocused, you're dead. Uh, so that would be my, my probably two biggest advice, uh, piece of advice for if you're in college. Thank you for all these uh, sincere and the practical suggestions. Uh, okay, uh, our time's short. We still got a, a couple, a several, questions. I will move fast. Okay, the next one is, uh, okay, how do you got the opportunity to work with Daniel Wu and produce movie together? Um, oh, Daniel... uh, let, let me just add one more thing for, for ones who don't know what Daniel Wu is. Wu Yanzu, right? that's Chinese, it's mm. Chinese name. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Daniel, um, I knew him because we both studied uh, wushu together, which was like a Chinese martial art. It's the same thing that like Jet Li did. And um, I was really into it. Daniel was really into it. He actually started the wushu club at the University of Oregon. And I, I, I was at Berkeley and I was like a, kind of like an assistant coach there. And Daniel is from the Bay Area. So in the summers, he would come back to the Bay Area and he would train in wushu at the, the Berkeley wushu club with me. And one time we even went to China together to study um, at, with the Beijing Wushu team for like a month or so. Uh, so the, what, what kind of style? Um, we're mostly doing Tsang Chen, like long fist. Oh, okay. And, and so that's how we knew each other. Uh, around the time I was doing all my startups, he and going to Hong Kong, his sister was like a VJ in the, uh, like a video jockey, kind of like a DJ, but on, on TV. And then she got him, I think some act, the modeling gig. Then he got discovered by a director was in a movie, like an art house movie. And then Jackie Chan discovered him. And then he got big over there. And then later on when he was pretty big in Hong Kong, I was doing Rotten Tomatoes. I was visiting Rotten Tomatoes, uh, Asia. We were hanging out. 
And he pitched me an idea for a movie that he wanted to direct. And I thought it was an interesting idea. And so I put some money in to do that. Um, and then from there, uh, basically they're a boy band, um, a fake boy band. They were trying to make a statement about the entertainment industry in Asia. And they actually made a mockumentary, which was a movie called The Heavenly Kings. Um, and they were a band called Alive. And then they had this website called Alive Not Dead for the band. But then after the movie came out, we decided to expand it to a MySpace-like um, social media platform for celebrities and artists to connect to their fans. Uh, and so then that's how we ended up doing a company together. Well, you you know, I just can't help myself. Number one is that I really want to see a video clip of you practice martial art. <laughs> that's number one, because you're you're known in our community as the founder, entrepreneur, investor. And I definitely want to see the other part of you. Uh, I think that's that's really really cool. And the second part is that um, I saw some chats in the from the audience as well as talk about how do we have more of a role models and um, you know representations of a strong Asian, uh, not only just in the entrepreneur founder side, but also from for example from media and from uh, you know other type of business. Now we would love to have Daniel to invite Daniel to you know give a talk to us as well if you don't mind inviting him. Uh, I don't mind asking him um, whether or not he's able to do it. I mean, that's completely up to him. But yeah, I don't mind passing a message on and, and seeing if he's interested for sure. Right. And uh, here is a, I put a YouTube link <laughs> of a video from a long right. time ago. I had already kind of stopped, but then it was for my Chinese school. They were doing like a 20 year anniversary. And so I actually went back to train again for like half a year to get back in shape to be able <laughs> to do it. So, um, and even now it's, this is a long time ago. Um, but yeah, there's, that's, that was me. And then I remember one year we actually, Daniel and I competed in a competition and he got first place and I got second place. Um, cool. which is funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. so what we will do is that we typically will send, um, a link of a recording to the attendees and cause some people cannot make it during conflict of time, but we'll also make sure that we embed this link. Uh, as well, so they can enjoy the entrepreneur talk and they can also enjoy the art, martial art. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is if, if people do want to reach out, uh, like I said, I like to try to be helpful. Um, and I, I put, I'll put my email into the, the chat. Um, if you want to add me on LinkedIn, you need to put my email in. Uh, you can use this email. Feel free to add me. Um, feel free to hit me up with questions or anything if I wasn't able to answer your question. So Patrick, what is the Pat Patrick doubt? Oh, I, uh, I mean, obviously that's the Pat, email it, address, right? Yeah, Pat is for Patrick, and then I used to be a really big like No Doubt fan. They're a band. Um, oh. uh, when I got to college, I, their album Tra Tragic Kingdom came out, and I really, really liked it. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I just combined it to be Pat Doubt at Gmail. And then actually, if you look at all my social media, it's actually Rotten Doubt, Rotten from Rotten Tomatoes, Doubt from No Doubt. So it's, oh. it's kind of a interesting name but because it's kind of a weird name like no it's always available everywhere i go um and it's kind of funny because you take rotten and you take doubt uh you put them together it sounds like negative but it's kind of like a double negative it's like rotten doubt yeah <laughs> yeah so that yeah the other question i forgot to ask so where is the rotten tomato name come from so it's the tomato but it's rotten tomato why yeah so san came up with the name um it's basically kind of like two answers the the weird answer was part of it was he was watching some movie, which I've never seen called Leolo. And, and in it, there was some weird scene, like a dream sequence where a lady got impregnated, impregnated by a tomato. And that's one what? thing he says, okay. but the, the, the one that we always tell everyone um, is, you know, back in the old days, like, I don't know, Shakespeare days, you'd have live performers. If they're on stage and are performing and they're terrible, people would throw things on stage. Usually it's rotten fruits and vegetables. And rotten tomatoes is like one of the things they would throw. And so that's how he got the name. Um, basically, if, if the movie is bad, you throw round tomatoes at it. And so if it's good, we have a fresh tomato, but if it's bad, it actually looks, it looks like a green asterisk, but it's really the idea is it's a rotten tomato that went splat on the wall. And that's why it looks like a little green splat. Ah, very interesting. All right. Okay, so I think we already taken a lot of time Hi, <laughs> from, Ryan. From, from his family. Uh, as a new dad, and I know that, uh, you know, sleep is very important. So we'll return you back to your family. And uh, thank you so much.
real time. Yeah, Fiona? thanks so much for having me, Lake. Thanks for having me, uh, Fiona. And yeah, and thank you to everyone who's come to listen to my talk. Yeah. Great thanks to Patrick and Lake and everyone for joining tonight's High Star Talk. Thanks for being open, generous, and authentic. I'm personally very inspired by your sharing and insights, and I believe our audience are like me too. Okay, so very lastly, I want to draw attention that High Star is recruiting volunteers. So if you are interested in joining us, please send us email. Nevertheless, you are always welcome to follow us and we will see you in our future events. 